There must be better ways to spend a working life. The concept of human assembly lines created mass production. But what kind of fulfillment can there be for human beings mechanically repeating the same movements over and over again? Soon, however, jobs like this may have to be a thing of the past. This fluorescent light factory in Holland is owned by Philips, the giant multinational company. And in the past few years, the shape of their production lines has been changing. This line was put in 25 years ago, and they still keep it going for a few specialist lamps. Lamps that are expensive because people are expensive. But eight years ago, this more productive, more mechanized process was introduced for the more popular lamps. About 15 men supervise it, and working flat out, it makes about 2,000 lamps an hour. But it's now old technology. Things are changing again. To this. It's a similar machine, but the new technology of the silicon chip has made it possible, virtually overnight, for the same 15 people to double their output. At 4,000 an hour, it's so fast that the men on their own couldn't keep pace with it. So now there's a new kind of supervisor, the computer. Every part of the process is monitored with sensors which report to the computer about faults or failures even before they happen. When the computer reports that something's up, the men can put it right. This has reduced the number of stoppages, reduced wastage. Of course, it's a long time before a machine will do every job in a factory, even on like this. But most of the jobs here are becoming more skilled, demanding more from the brain and less from the muscle. When this comes fully into production, other manufacturers will feel the keener wind of competition unless they too have used this new technology. Philips is big, very big, with over 400,000 workers, many of them in Britain. But even huge multinationals like this have been coming under pressure. Philips is in the electronics business, so are the Japanese. Their electrical products have been flooding markets all over the world. Their products, as a rule, are reliable, good, and not too expensive. Is this and a so threat to you? Is this a threat to you? Yes. And what do you need to do in order to fight off this competition? Well, first, to be at least as innovative as they are. And also, it's not sufficient to have this information in your laboratory to bring it rapidly to the market. And in order to bring it rapidly to the market, you have to, to use efficient manufacturing means. You should not be afraid of mechanization or of in investing in, in more sophisticated machinery in order to make your manufacturing process as competitive as possible. For that's the thing they are doing. Even in Eindhoven, Philips's hometown, employment has been falling. New technology introduced to keep the company competitive has been the cause. If it's not to go on falling, the company must look to new markets or new products. So, who must sink or swim in the marketplace? Because right now, huge multinational companies in Europe, Japan and America are competing for your business, for the money you'll spend in the high street 
over the next 10 years. This particular machine is Dutch and it's using two new technologies, lasers and microelectronics, and it'll open up entire new industries, factories, shops, and perhaps thousands of new jobs, and also opportunities for people who make programs, because it's really a gramophone record for television. These discs are pressed just as cheaply as the conventional ones. You'll be able to buy one in a shop, put it on a machine like this, and hear the sound of your favorite pop group, symphony orchestra, or of a sporting event in stereophonic sound, and at the same time, see the pictures on television. The laser fires a tiny beam of light and information stamped as dots on the disc. The light is reflected back and the fluctuations turn into the electrical signals needed to make the picture. It doesn't matter if the disc is distorted, the microelectronic controls keep the laser beam exactly on course. This also uses a laser to replace the conventional stylus on your record player. It's a mock-up of what your record turntable could look like in the early 1980s. It's basically using a new technology to improve an old idea, how to get sound or music from a disc. And if the idea does catch on, then it could alter the whole shape of the industry, the people who make conventional styluses, record players, and the records themselves. Chips or small electronic circuits it's inside here enable them to produce a machine this compact and this small and the disc itself is virtually indestructible it doesn't matter whether you scratch it drop it on the floor or rub your dirty thumbprints all over it it won't matter the laser will beam right through the dirt and pick up the sound the quality of that sound is likely to be superlative better than anything we've ever heard before and because the laser never touches the disc it won't wear out Companies like Philips, big as they are, are having to use the new technology in order to survive. This derelict factory on the North Circular Road outside London is a memorial to a once successful company which failed to realise that because of new technology, the world had suddenly changed. Gross was a family firm run by two brothers, and at one time they made these good old-fashioned solid mechanical cash registers. The firm really took off in the 1970s with this machine and the introduction of decimal coinage. But time was running out for this old established firm. New electronic cash registers were flooding the market, mainly from Japan. They were cheap, reliable, easy to service, and they did a multitude of jobs. Well, here, they understood all about mechanics, not electronics, and very soon, the firm began to go bust. What saved Gross Brothers from total extinction was a takeover by Chubb, the security firm. And Chubb realized that the company's products were hopelessly out of date. What the new owners did reveals what may be in store for literally thousands of firms in Britain and millions of workers. First, the management realized it must introduce a new machine based on electronics and not mechanics. It was the only way to keep the firm alive. Quite simply, we would have become more and more uncompetitive and we would have gone out of business. We had no other option but to either compete on those terms or to leave the business. Now, we are not prepared to do this. We're the only British cash register company left. We've got a lot of experience of mechanical re cash registers. We've got a large labor force here in the factory and we after a lot of heart searching decided that the only way we could go forward was to produce our own microprocessor based cheap cash you... register this explains why the old-fashioned mechanical cash register needed about three and a half thousand components to enable it to do simple things like add up subtract and uh, give you your receipt the kind of things you take for granted when you're paying for your goods at the supermarket well, now with the new micros, all this will be replaced by this. Just 600 components, two circuit boards and a few silicon chips. The firm buys them at the moment from America for 18 pounds, but soon they may only cost a few pence. Now, this enables them to produce a machine like this, a micro machine, cheaply, thereby competing with foreign imports. 
Chubb had taken over a company with a manufacturing tradition based on making mechanical parts. So with fewer parts needed for a machine based on micros, it clearly meant fewer workers too. The next step was to carry the workforce with them. It was a stroke of brilliance to organise a trip abroad for a party of shop stewards. Chubb took them to a cash register trade fair in Germany to see what the competitors were putting in the market. My first reaction was, God, we're way behind times because we, the machine that we were making at that time was absolutely compared to what we saw there. And you, you, you were convinced then about what? Well, it convinced me that this, the company that had taken over would have to go into the electronics field very, very quickly and they'd have to bring out a new machine basically to catch up with the com competitors and that was just to catch up. Did you have a hard job selling it to the workers when you came back? Uh, yes, because basically they hadn't seen what I had seen and they still had fears about how many people were going to lose their jobs and what was going to take part in the new machines, whether it would be actually feasible or not. Now, but I was convinced it was necessary. Of course, some people had to go. There were redundancies. After all, if this mechanical part, which took about eight hours to assemble, was to be replaced by this little chip, then fewer workers were needed. But what eventually happened to this firm could apply to companies all over Britain, whose manufacturing process is based on making mechanical parts. They joined the electronics business whether they wanted it or not. In this case, it was too late. Chubbs poured an enormous amount of time, effort and money into the production of an electronic cash register. But tragically, a year after we filmed in the factory, the combined pressures of competition and the recession forced them to stop production. The early hopes came to nothing. In the past decade, the introduction of the microelectronic computer, the silicon chip, has changed the whole concept of how industry and those in it will work, and it'll mean a major rethink in Britain. It's everywhere. A new age of control, brought about by sudden access to miniaturized electronic circuits, computers on a tiny chip. Hornby, the name's been synonymous with model railways for years, have been fighting off fierce competition from foreign manufacturers, particularly the Germans. So the companies turned to the new micros to create a revolutionary way of controlling model railways. Why did you need to develop this system? Well, we basically felt that the industry needed something different. Uh, you had to bring more operational realism into trains, and this is the only way you can do it. How does it work? Well, essentially you have uh, corded electronic signals that are mixed with power and you feed them down the track. The train picks up the signal, controls the speed as it's commanded from the master controller. You just have two wires from the master controller and that's it. In a conventional layout, you probably would need the equivalent of a thousand wires. It enables you to control speed and direction of up to 16 locomotives. Yes. Uh, you can also control up to 100 points or ancillaries. This kind of control, and you wouldn't have been able to do this a few years ago, is very important to Hornby, because it now believes its future is more secure. Unfortunately, the number of examples of British products using micros like this up to now is very small indeed. I think it has to be an almost instinctive reaction of any desire of any consumer durable, for example, to think automatically about the microprocessor as a way in which he can uh, make his product better. Microelectronics can help everywhere in industry, starting with the design of parts. At this firm, electronic drawing boards help to create the complicated shape for a car's side lights. A microcontrol model maker makes a prototype from information supplied electronically direct from the drawing board. And in weeks rather than months, the concept can become the finished product. Lucas designed a control system to monitor the 
gases in a furnace heat treating diesel parts. This British invention, using microelectronics, is simply fitted on to the made furnace. The old rule of thumb way of controlling the gas mixture has been replaced by more exact, continuous microelectronic control. The failure rate has fallen from 30% to nearly zero. The furnace works faster, it saves energy. But again, the number of examples of this kind of application in Britain is small. Well, the basic national problem is we are not training enough good electronics men, good electronic systems engineers, good software people, and even good old-fashioned solid-state physicists. Our universities and academic institutions are just not turning out enough. They're turning out about 25% at the moment of what we really need. Secondly, we have, as I said, been short of the funds. Uh, in industry necessary to plough back into this very difficult area. And thirdly, um, I say many of our good people have gone overseas, the people we've already had. So those are three main difficulties that we have to contend with. But Lucas is a big company. It's got the resources and the know-how. Most people, though, work in small companies. So what about them? The Thamesmead Industrial Estate lies in a new town on the banks of the Thames near Woolwich and the micro-revolution has almost passed it by. This industrial estate is similar to most of the others in Britain. The majority of the firms on it are small, the sort that might well benefit from introducing microelectronics. Well, there are 20 companies here and yet only two of them have adopted the chip. This figure is very much in line with the government's own statistics. The Department of Industry says that of all the companies in Britain, only 8% of them have done anything at all about microelectronics, and most of those were already in the electronics business. This means that through either complacency or ignorance, the vast bulk of British industry, 92% of it, has done precisely nothing about the new technology. Michael Windybank owns a small light engineering factory. Among other things, he makes central heating boilers. These will end up in a local authority's council houses. Michael's also invented a new boiler. When it goes into production, it'll be smaller, more compact, easier to fit, and more efficient. But he's decided not to incorporate microelectronics into its design. He prefers to stick to the methods he knows. Uh, I'm a bit frightened of it, to tell you the truth. Frightened? Yeah. I'm frightened of the cost of it. Yeah. And the other thing I'm a bit worried about is the uh, effect that it's going to have with the large manufacturers. And I think it will enable them to produce small quantity products. Would that hurt you? Yes, it would, because we are small quantity product companies. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that you're going to have to get involved somehow? Well, we are. We can't help it. I think uh, everyone must get involved with microchips. Otherwise, we're going to be out of business. Do you know how to do it? I mean, how to start, even? Haven't a clue, no. You don't even know who to go to, or anything? No, I don't. Yeah. Ray, you've taken... Ray Kerno is an electronics consultant who was commissioned to find out whether firms on the estate could benefit from the new technology. Let's take this new boiler he's invented. It may be a new boiler, but it's still got old-fashioned controls that run off electrical signals from things like thermostats you may have in your lounge or your bedroom. What sort of controls? Like the timer, you mean? Just like an ordinary timing switch. Mm. But he could replace the whole of that with a vantage by a microelectronic control device. It would be cheaper, far more reliable, and what's more, it could give the flexibility that's going to be required in the future. Now you've been right around this estate. Do you think that other firms could benefit, like Michael, from new technology? Every single one of them. Why haven't they done it? Largely because they don't know enough about the subject, and they largely also they don't know where to begin. Ray, um, you told me that uh, this was the most uh, revolutionary concept since the wheel. Do you really believe that? Yes, I do. I think, in fact, that if we look back historically, that what we've seen before in automation was really mechanization, in other words, replacing man's... The government, through the Department of Industry, has an educational program. It uses consultants like Ray Kerno to teach businessmen about the new technology. Grants are available to conduct feasibility studies, and there's money for development, too. ...all the various case histories that we've been looking at in doing this awareness program. The first thing is that in practically every case, uh, the companies have achieved a payback uh, in between one and three years. 
So, <clears throat> setting aside the levels... As part of this scheme, we help the government consultants to organise an educational and a feasibility programme on the estate. And it all started with this meeting. Do you feel it's something that your company would be interested in getting involved in? Um, no, I don't actually, because um, I think that uh, you're taking a small industrial estate like this. The fact that we are small businesses, small companies, um, a lot of the problem, I don't think that, uh, apart from knowing about microelectronics, um, I don't think most people can afford to go into microelectronics. Can I ask you a question? Are you cynical about the new technology? Uh, are you uh, a doubting Thomas or... Or what? I'm a doubting Thomas, actually. It's, a doubting uh, Thomas? It's possibly because it's all new to me. I'm just listening. I'm not too sure. I think the problem is, is that in, in all the cases that you put forward, you talked of multinational type companies, um, you know, where, where there are obviously is going to be great application. But, I mean, on this particular <coughs> industrial estate, I mean, you know, they're all, we're all small companies, really. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really... I'm not sceptical, I think what, what you say is completely right, and I can see from what you say that the applications that we could put it to in our own company, yeah. but the point is you've got, I mean, I'm only middle management, you've got to sell this to senior management, and most of our senior management are um, men in their late 50s and early 60s, and I, I believe that you would have a difficulty selling it to them, quite honestly. During last summer, consultants contacted the firms on the estate to offer them practical help feasibility studies on how the new technology could affect their businesses. And the results, after all this effort, were frankly disappointing. Metal we should turn our attention to. Building up towards a scale that starts to justify looking at it in more depth. And at that point, considering whether or not the state of the art has reached a satisfactory point that it can deal with copper. That's really what I think we're concerned. That's right, yes. Another difficulty I personally have assessing um, a control system is that I base <coughs> everything on my existing knowledge, which is based, of course, on um, c conventional control systems. So you'd be I'm, stepping outside. I'm not outside. thinking microprocessors. Right. Words. Right. There was a lack of understanding that there are competitors eagerly willing to take their business. A lack of understanding, in fact, about the imperative for them to change. And the other set of reasons is the fact that for a small businessman. The intrusion of time that's represented by having to listen to something else, something they don't particularly welcome, they don't see the reason why, is really a massive intrusion. They can't spare the time, and indeed the, the very money that's involved, the down payment, although it's returned, is quite a big element of cash flow for these people. What do you think are going to be the implications for them if they don't? They'll go bankrupt. Be I mean, will this be because of their competitors or what? Oh yes, the competitors are there, ready and willing. There are people in Europe who can deliver goods based upon more automated factories and deliver and knock those people out of the market. The fact is that these businesses are doing all right now and in some cases to introduce computer systems into their manufacturing would be unwise, premature or a waste of money. But what of the future? What if their competitors, particularly those abroad, decide to modernize first? How many gross brothers will there be if technology overtakes them? And why is it that the big chip manufacturers find it difficult to sell their products to British firms? It's not as easy as we would like it to be, let me say that. Why? I think, uh, I mean, industry in, in England is not well known for moving quickly anyway. Um, microelectronics is a technology which by its nature is very, very rapidly moving. It's not something that you can wait to make the decision till next year or the year after. It's, it's rather easy to apply. It's not difficult to add microelectronic capability to a product. And I think this is fairly unique. Most of our industries have never been, uh, in fact, they've probably had advantages by being slow moving. But not because if, if you move too quickly, I think, in uh, some situations, you can, you can lose out. But not that there. is definitely not the case with microelectronics. If... It so happens that the Americans have probably got a 10 year lead in the whole field, across the whole field of uh, electronic development. From the chips themselves, right across to applying the chips and the microcomputers to advanced systems. Just the Americans? No, the Americans are preeminent, and of course the Japanese have had enough sense to get along very quickly behind. Why are we so far behind? I think basically because the environment in Great Britain has not been very conducive to 
running and working hard in this type of field. Outside Britain, other countries seem to have met the challenge of the new technology faster than we have. In Sweden, robots are now becoming commonplace. Proportionately, there are 30 times more of these machines in use than in Britain. The one British robot manufacturer sells nearly all his machines abroad. British industry doesn't want them. This one's operating within a big company, so the comparison with Thamesmead is unfair. But it's working in a small space, making the kind of products manufactured by little companies. It's replaced the work of three women who used to manufacture the parts this way. In comparison with the human workers, the machine doesn't need a tea break. It can work 24-hour shifts if necessary. Unlike the women, its health won't be affected by the dust in a confined space. Its arms won't suffer any aches or pains, and it's totally flexible. It'll do a wide variety of different jobs. are becoming cheaper than human beings. The perils of industry ignoring this revolution are plain enough to see. Even more uncertain is what the change will do to people. The human being is a fragile creature. Unlike robots, people have feelings like resentment, pride, jealousy, and above all, the instinct for self-preservation. And here, where machines now well together Saab cars in Sweden, humans are disappearing. By far the most important challenge now facing industry is how to accommodate people, people and machines. Managements who want fewer workers, workers who'll do different jobs, or no jobs at all if machines do it for them. Once, this man was a skilled welder. Now he watches a robot doing his job. Men are still needed, machines break down. About twice a week, they have to move in and repair them. Right now, this man likes his new job, watching instead of doing. Right now, because he's still got a job to do. This is much better. This is better? Yeah. Why? In what way? Because uh, there's not so much physical work. You, you have uh, not to lift anything and... Yeah, it, it all goes automatically. Is it a little bit more boring for you? Some jobs, yes. Already in Britain, conflicting attitudes between management and unions over what to do about the new technology has resulted in several appalling confrontations. The strike at the Times, which put the papers off the streets for nearly a year and cost Thompson's £30 million, 
began when management wanted to introduce new computer control machines. The unions worried about who was going to man them and who might eventually lose their jobs. There are grave doubts whether the fragile industrial relations in this country are in any shape to cope with the new technology. Whether what actually happened here may be just the beginning. What's your opinion about the relationship between management and unions in this country vis-a-vis -vis the new technology? Well, there isn't one. I regret to say it. Uh, I will be put in a position, almost certainly, in, unless attitudes change, in 12 months to two years' time, where I'm going to be an unwilling Luddite. I'm going to have to tell my members and other officers of other unions are going to have to tell their members to resist technology because we can't come to arrangements to put the thing in. Why? Because we're not getting any response from employers. In Sweden, their rush hour might be the same as ours, but when it comes to the new technology, they're doing things differently. It's a small country with a high standard of living. Like us, Sweden is dependent upon its industrial competitiveness. Unlike us, the unions and managements are learning to cope by working out the ground rules together. You can um, sit down, 10 or 15 people together, in your own working place, on paid working time, and uh, discuss the uh, our aims, and discuss how you should uh, negotiate with the management about this thing. Now, what's the purpose behind it? The purpose is that we should be able to negotiate with the management about how computers should be used so that we, after this negotiation, can tell the technicians how they should work, what they should do. In other words, giving you the same kind of power as management to control the technology? Yes, that's correct. The important thing is, uh, as I see it, that we can arrange so that the employees and their trade unions will have a reasonable chance to learn about new technology, to know about which the effects may be. But I think it is as important that employees and their trade union representatives are given new chances to come into this work, to participate actively and to have a real influence on what is done. And we are uh, bargaining and negotiating on this at the table now. It is, of course, easier in Scandinavia. Factory workers in Norway have only one union. At this arms factory, where microprocessors have been introduced into the manufacturing systems, workers and management monitor, indeed control, the changes this will bring. And they do it together. The Norwegians have approached the problems posed by the new technology in a way which many believe to be a model for us all. The right for workers to be informed about technological change, to know as much as management, to be consulted at every stage, is now written into the Norwegian trade union agreements. This man, a union representative, now has another title. He's a data steward responsible for negotiating with management on all aspects of technological change. Of course, the reason for this is not only because they, uh, it's, it's part of the, uh, the attitude which has developed since the war, but it's also because uh, experience shows that uh, if you can create the right atmosphere, you can increase productivity much more than by any system. Any system can be sabotaged. And if you have unwilling people and people who are not interested and don't see their own uh, good and see uh, what's a fulfilling of their needs in a system, you are hopelessly lost in this world anyway. I think uh, this technology is a very good technology. We shall use it. So I think our work is on how it should be used. I want it. I know that we need it. But the point is, unless we can get together with management, unless they can change their attitudes and trust unions and trust us with information, then we are just not going to have this technology in. What will we do with them? If we don't get cooperation, there must inevitably be, unfortunately, a larger number of disputes in industry over bringing it in. I, I think it very regrettable. I think it very, very avoidable. 
It's the easiest thing in the world to do what the Norwegians have done, have a series of technology agreements, which is what the TUC are trying to and suggesting we negotiate. My particular union is trying very hard to negotiate. And the response? So far, absolutely zero. If we don't move now and move very, very quickly, both large and small companies alike, I think we, we run a major risk of losing competitiveness uh, across many, many of our uh, product areas and service areas. We still have time uh, to stay in this race if we run very hard now. We've got to work extremely hard. We've got to make very logical and very careful choices as to what areas we work in. I believe we've still got a number of years to stay in the race, but we must, we must go very hard now. We must have full collaboration between the government, industry, the university, uh, government research establishments, etc. Everybody has got to march in step and understand what we're trying to do. So there is probably just enough time if we start work now and work like hell. Proof that industry must change, that attitudes must change, is here. It's in the middle of Holland, in an all-automatic warehouse, devoid in this gigantic storage room of any human beings at all. It's owned by Philips. It's one of the biggest in the world and it's controlled by a small computer. It doesn't need to be heated, there are no people around to get cold. The lifting, selecting, the filing, the conveyor line, it's all done by machines. As the cases of light bulbs come in, other cases go out. There are humans here in the computer room monitoring the electronics. But the day is nearly here when man will also be building factories which won't need many men. Prototypes have already been built in Sweden and Japan. So what future will it be for industry? What future will it be for any country and for us if we don't heed the warnings now? No one really knows what the impact of the new technology will have on jobs or on our quality of life. Already in isolated examples like this, machines have taken over the jobs normally done by men. In this electrical, mechanical, all automated warehouse, they're clearly more efficient than us. This is an example, perhaps at its most spectacular, of what the world of the future will be like. And it's something which British industry must be striving for as well. How we come to terms with the new microelectric technology is something we cannot ignore, nor can we shelve it. It's something which all of us must be thinking of right now.